Imagine delving into the life and work of your favorite artist, sifting through her books, belongings, and letters, and most importantly, her artwork. Sometimes you group the items chronologically, sometimes by theme, spending hours tracing threads through her life. And since traveling to access materials in person is not always possible, you can do all this research from the comfort of your own home, thanks to the artist's digital catalog raisonné. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Liz Neely, the curator of digital experience at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe. The museum is working on a series of projects to develop new ways of revealing connections between art, archival, and historic home collections to facilitate a broader exploration and study of Georgia O'Keeffe. These projects imagine access to collections through discovery, storytelling, and ultimately a digital catalog raisonné. Liz is a human-centered strategist focusing on forming engaging experiences for museum audiences while designing sustainable organizational workflows. Thank you so much for joining us today, Liz. This is such a pleasure to talk with you. And I guess I just wanted to get started by asking, what does the Curator of Digital Experiences do at the O'Keeffe Museum? Thanks, Ellen. I'm so happy to be here as well. So thanks for having me. Yes, it's actually a really unique title in museums. It's not one that you'll find many of. Maybe I'm the only one, but perhaps there are more. So being the curator of digital experience, I'm really focused on how we can use digital technologies, whether that's something online or in the gallery experience, everything from experiential to infrastructural, to engage and serve the audiences that come to the museum, that come online, who are doing research. So that can be anything from publishing collections, which we'll talk more about, or also thinking of different ways of doing storytelling in the galleries, like some immersive clouds and things like that. So it really runs the gamut and it seems pretty wide, but for me, I feel like it's all so connected in how we think about content collections and how we deliver those to a variety of audiences. It sounds almost like two out of three of your primary audiences may not set foot in your museum. It's really true. Being a single artist museum of a well-known artist is that not only um, do we serve a lot of people just through the website or through other means, but also we have a museum and galleries, but we also have a research component. We have the historic homes. And then we also serve a lot of research requests and support exhibitions around the world. So it's also people may be seeing O'Keeffe's in person, but we have some role within that to help make those exhibitions what they are. Tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing in the position of curator of digital experience in terms of building sort of a digital collection, putting all that stuff online so people can engage with it. Yes, it's been a really exciting journey. I have been working for the museum for almost four years now, but I did some work with the museum before that. And one of the first things that we identified that would really serve a wider set of audiences is that we have these fantastic art collections, but also archive collections, which is letters, there's her personal book collection. There are her historic homes, so that's clothing. It's the kind of stereo that she has and everything. And there were a lot of connections amongst these things, whether it's a photograph of her moving around an artwork or of the building of the properties. So there was a lot of crossover. And so what we really have been trying to do over the last four or five years and then moving forward is provide a way to provide connections 
so that you can learn about the art, but you could see a photograph of her with the art. You can see the belt that was forged by a certain New Mexico artist that she wore every time she was photographed by a certain photographer. That there are all these ways that we can at least provide the connections and then other people can also make what you will of that. I think one of the things is that we don't wanna just tell you what to think of that, but provide those connections to explore. So um, through that, we have our collections online, which have all of these various connections between collections, and that's in a browsable format showing these connections, but also we are committed to using data standards that are used throughout the museum world so that not only is it extensible within our own collections, but that we can also make connections with other museums that are using these standards and that you can access data sources. So I'll stop with the nerdy start there. <laughs> so what would another museum maybe be able to do with correlating that data? I guess I'm curious about how you do it. There are a few different ways that it can work. We mentioned kind of an end goal of having a catalog resume. You can think that kind of why we want to scale everything so that we are open to connecting to how other people are describing their art and their materials in the archive. So, for example, in the art museum field, the Getty has a set of vocabularies or the Library of Congress has a vocabulary. So when we say something is by George O'Keefe, we know which George O'Keefe I'm talking about the same George O'Keefe that the Getty is talking about, that the Met is talking about, that the Art Institute of Chicago is talking about. But also, if you talk about a work on paper, that is something that everyone knows what we're talking about. And how that can be used, well, even just in browsing, you know that there's a like things that you can talk about. But taking it two steps forward, one way is if you access data and you put it in spreadsheets and things like that, that it will talk to one another. And then that next step is that if you publish it all together as a future digital catalog resume, you know like things. There are a lot of different ways of using it. And I think there's a lot of ways that haven't even been realized quite yet. And this data will be accessible to the public, generally speaking. Is that accurate? Yes. Actually, right now we have a open linked open data set. It's a little tricky sometimes, <laughs> but it, it's there. I just worked with a computer science class at UNM last semester, I believe it was. And they started looking at that and crossing it over because the other thing that is there are also open data sets about weather. There are open data sets about place. You can look at a date and see what was the weather on that date. So you can actually cross things over in linked data with other kinds of data sets. Just for my purposes and for the sake of the listener, I actually want to back up almost to the very beginning just to get nomenclature down. A raisin A is a what? That is a really good question because I feel like I might not have known that 10 years ago myself. So working for a single artist museum is really interesting because I used to work for the Art Institute of Chicago, which is an encyclopedic museum. So the way that you think about collections and data is quite different because you're thinking about it over millennia of time and all kinds of art forms. With a single artist museum, we're not as broad, but we go deep. And what a catalog resume is, and what it traditionally is, is um, if we were video, I would hold up a very heavy two volume book. It is the authoritative kind of listing of an artist's work. And there can be a catalog resume for an artist's work on paper, and then a different one for their paintings but it really kind of serves to say, this has been verified as a work by this artist. And then it usually has a certain distinct scholarly amount of information around it. In the art world, it's um, provenance, which is who owned it and when, and how did it get transferred from one person to another? And it has a publication history, so where has this been published? And it has an exhibition history. The print version are very important to an artist's work because it really shows the full span from the first work, so you number something. But there are also limitations to anything in print. Like I said, it's very heavy, it's expensive. These kinds of things are almost databases in book form because as soon as you publish it, of course, 
if it's in a new exhibition, the exhibition history is out of date. If the work gets sold to a new person, the provenance is out of date and the current owner. So for a single artist, it really shows what that person did in the full span of their life. The catalog resume for Georgia O'Keeffe is from 1999. So there have been a couple exhibitions since then. So that's the kind of challenge with the print edition. But you're trying to make it all digital. You're trying to do a digital raisonné. Yeah, so what the vision is, is we have an NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant, a level one version. And what we're doing is really seeing what is the potential of a digital catalog resume. And there are actually quite a few digital catalog resumes. We're not the first to do this. We want to explore if we can expand the definition of what this is. I hear a lot in talks about catalog resumes, authoritative, which I'd love us to move away from as a field. I'm actually using it pretty deliberately here that like in the print edition, there have been digital editions. And I think there's still a lot of thought in the field that a digital edition, sometimes it needs to stop in time so that it can be a reliable source. So there's that version. There's other versions that look pretty much like the print version, but are just digitally available. And then there are other ones that look more like a museum's collections online. And all those things are fine. What we're doing with this grant is we're actually talking to makers of catalog resumes. We're talking to users. We're talking to people who are thinking about digital scholarly publishing in general to think about, can we push this a little further? And can we think about this as something that is generative, that changes, but what are the mitigations that we can have this be a living document, but still have the reliability that is afforded to a catalog resume. And one of the things that we're really excited about exploring is that definition of a catalog resume fixed and can it not be expanded or how far can it be expanded if you do things like give attribution to changes, mark the changes, um, if you embed uncertainty, if you have transparency around that. I think this is really about digital scholarly publishing and how we can have scholarly publishing really act in a way for scholars and researchers that's different than print fundamentally. We could probably go down this rabbit hole for two hours, but to me, it begs the question though, the fact that the print version is in print means, okay, so it can't be changed because it's a book, but you're still presuming that whoever wrote and compiled that raisonné is the authority. So if this was a traditional print raisonné, who's the authority? I think that's a great question. As a born digital person, I'm actually surprised by how much print still gives something a weight. So Barbara Bluler Lyons was the scholar with advisors, is the author of the digital catalog resume of George O'Keefe. And I do believe that there's a certain sense of she has earned and continues to earn her place as a scholar of George O'Keefe. So indeed that personality, the person of an author plays a part in it. And so I think one of the things that we are going to explore in through a series of surveys and then some interviews and then some workshops is, can you have something that's still reliable if it is multi-authored? What do you need to know about the authors to have that trust and faith and that reliability? Because Barbara Bueller Lyons is a scholar of Georgia O'Keeffe. That is well known and she has earned that through many years of work and I have a lot of respect for her work. Trying to get at that though, is there something essential about the print? Is there something essential about the trust that you have in that certain author, in that certain scholar? And then how do we bring that forward into a 21st century document, thinking about scholarship differently? Because can a digital catalog resume serve as a reliable source for certain things and then areas of scholarly community dialogue and others? of uncertainty, of a changing environment, of new discoveries, of diverse voices even, because different people will think about George O'Keefe differently, especially if we're talking about humanities and we're talking about the art and life of George O'Keefe. If someone's coming from a different discipline than art history, someone's coming from a different background, if we can open this up to a broader, diverse set of voices, it actually complicates the story. So can you have complication and reliability at the same time. I think it's a fascinating 
thought process around digital scholarly publishing in general, especially when in the realm of museums where there's this idea of a trusted source, but we also want to let more voices in to our trusted source. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Liz, about what it means to be the curator of digital experience and the different kinds of digital experiences you have been building and that you're also envisioning building in the future. I wanted to ask about what's sort of driving your sense of need. Do you get feedback from researchers or from other museums or from scholars that helps you sort of say, well, we need to do our digital collections like this, or what we really need is this? Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. That's a great question, and I think that it comes at us from a few different directions. One of the reasons, especially with our collections, that we really wanted to connect art and archives and our historic home collections, which also includes art making materials like paint brushes and blank canvases, unfinished canvases. Canvases have been cut out so that no one would see what's in them. A lot of people, especially researcher audiences and researchers that are trying to put together an exhibition here or at another place, really wanted to know more. And we wanted to know, like, how are these things connected? So if you're interested in one of the Black Place paintings, then it really helps your understanding to a certain extent to see photographs of George O'Keefe in a tent at the Black Place, which is what she called a part of the Bistai Badlands and having tea there and how she would stay there. Or it might be interesting to see the view or a letter about her talking about her challenges with painting or how she feels about a certain painting or how she feels about an exhibition presentation. So what we also found is that in some ways in art history, you can look at, well, there's a material version where you only pay attention to the object and you want the object to speak for itself, which is a totally valid way of going. And then there are other people who are interested in biography and what led to the making, what is the context this was made in. And I think that what we're finding is that our audiences are very, very interested in the life of George O'Keefe and how she lived her life, how this woman in the 20th century kind of broke barriers to become a famous woman artist that kind of lived the life that she set out for herself, very independent. And that comes from the full spectrum, whether you're someone that visits or an educator or a researcher, what we've seen, and I'm saying this anecdotally, I don't have the stats on me, people are very interested in her life. And so I think we've increasingly added more of this to the gallery, but also that really speaks to our collections as well, because we do have these varied collections. And a lot of her artwork is spread throughout the world by her design. We have wonderful art, but our real strength is being able to tell the art and life. So that has driven how we connect things, how we want to tell a story that more than just the object, and then just moving forward, how do we better allow people to access that from different directions? So I'm super curious how you did build those connections. And I went down the rabbit hole at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum <laughs> website, and I thought, I'm not going to look at any of her art. I'm just going to look at her stuff. 
So I looked at her clothes and I looked at her books and I looked at the ephemera from her books, you know, the little things that were stuck in there or whatever. And I was astounded that I could be looking at a pair of shoes, but I could also be looking at the letter that her sister wrote her at the same time she bought the shoes or if I was looking at a blouse from 1931, then I could see all the other clothes she had from 1931. It's really amazing context for any given item, but there's also sort of these prods of you can also look at all this other stuff that was going on, or you can just look at all her shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> It feels like magic on the user end, but I'm sure somebody put some work into that and some thought into what kind of connections you wanted to build. And then how did you decide which connections you wanted to make and how did you build those into to the data? It's exciting stuff. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of connections. There are ones by association or by a broad category. And then there's direct ones. So direct connections are when we identify that this painting is also in these four photographs. So then that is something that someone here at the George O'Keefe Museum goes in and types it in and says, this is connected to this. And then there's still a long way to go with those kind of connections. But as we discover new things, there's a method for that. So it's all about designing workflows so that you can capture that. But what you see the most of is our different collections are stored and cataloged differently. But as long as we use standard approaches that are according to museum standards of how you call a date a date, how you call a shoe a shoe, is that a lot of those relationships that you see are then just drawing from that data. So it knows that in 1931, we know what 1931 is. It's in the data that we have. That date one comes in handy for me all of the time because I'm like, wait, what else did I see then? What are the letters that she was writing at that time? What are the letters she was writing after the exhibition about that? For our collections online, we have an open data set and we don't have to use the open data set to be leveraging the data. We're leveraging that by creating these connections by associations of sorts. So no one has to actually type that in. They don't have to type, this is associated with this and the team is great here. I don't do all of this. There's a full staff of people who are cataloging as long as we all agree on how we're cataloging things so that we can deliver things without someone having to type things in. So it's really using the data to show things that would take years for our museum to tag specifically. And then we would always be putting our bias on top of it as well. Are you also doing geospatial locations, like physical locations for objects or for pieces in the collection? We have not done that yet. Definitely, it is of a lot of interest because we did do a project where we found some of the New Mexico artworks and could see exactly where the viewpoint was. And so we could see the 3D view shed. That was done in a separate kind of program. The difficulty and why we just haven't done it is it's just kind of deciding what story you're telling there. For example, George O'Keefe painted a lot of bones at that time that confounded critics and was thought of as a very strange thing to do. But we can assume that the bones are from New Mexico, but we can't assume that that was painted in New Mexico because there were also a big box of bones that were shipped back to New York and cost a bunch of money to ship to New York. It's something we'll definitely want to do because it's of extreme interest, but thinking about, well, what does that mean in terms of what are we saying about that piece that has a subject matter that we know is from New Mexico, but it was probably painted in New York, or we don't know where a lot of things were painted. She did not like to be photographed while painting something. Those are the complex tornadoes that go on the head of a museum professional. <laughs> And the reason I'm asking in this particular case is because Georgia O'Keeffe, I think, for a lot of people is so much about place and it would be an interesting lens to look at. But yeah, it gets dicey and cloudy really quickly. We'll fix it sometime. We definitely will. Some of the themes in our galleries are by place because she was so affected by place, whether that was Lake George or New York. 
but she also went to a lot of places at the same times. So I guess what we want to make sure we do is that we offer something that's helpful, but not overly simplify it as well. You've been at this process for a long time. I mean, starting with digitization and building sort of web-based experiences. And you've done some virtual and immersive stuff as well for remote visitors. When you're thinking about here's how we're going to reach visitors or here's how we're going to engage people, are those audiences, the in-person and the remote audiences, are they considered equally important? That's interesting. Like, I guess these are about online interpretive experience or access to collections. Clearly our in-person visitors at some point engage with us online, especially now you need to reserve a ticket since the pandemic. So I think some online visitors become on-site visitors. And I think people who visit us, it's an amazing experience for us. We hope it's an amazing experience for them. Of course, not everyone can come to Santa Fe. So I'm not sure if we have a value scale to say we think about them equally, like one is more important than the other. I think they're just different audiences. And I think that's also a fluid kind of thing. And so I know that when I uh, approach a project, I think more in terms of a role that a person is playing, which is also can change over time. So there is a visiting guest. There are needs like transactional, what am I going to see? And then, yes, how are we going to serve them once they get here, whether it's through interpretive experiences. But online, it can be an educator, it could be a researcher, it can be someone putting together an exhibition, it can be an enthusiast. So an enthusiast audience for George O'Keefe is a pretty large part of our audience. There are a lot of enthusiasts, so we're very lucky in that way. Certainly numbers online are always, because it's global, are always much larger. But in terms of value, I can't even think about putting that all on a scale. With on-site visitors, in terms of thinking about digital experiences, we have done some study about how people want to engage in different ways. We're actually a fairly limited sized museum, and so really how can we expand the footprint of what we're offering through having places where you can dive into more of the experience there and something to slow you down. So it also serves a conservation purpose that we had a show where we showed some late watercolors, but many of the watercolors can only be shown for a certain amount of time because they're light sensitive. And so we could use you know a very simple digital presentation to offer a slideshow of other things that you can kind of compare and see, but that we can't show all the time. What we can't show you, we can show some of the watercolors and these are some other things to look at. With our more immersive gallery, using design to kind of provide a place to slow down and sit down and be in the dark uh, with a very tight. So thinking about those digital experiences on how do we kind of provide a varied experience so that there's a quiet, there's a loud, there's something to sit down and contemplate, that there's a way to see the work in a way that you hadn't seen before. So those are the kind of ways that we think about it inside the gallery. I think that's where the digital realm can really help. And I'm guessing that the size of the collection in terms of actual artwork is probably, what, 10 times larger than what you could show at any one time or something like that. Especially if you consider archival and other um, content. Online, you can kind of choose your own adventure. So that's also quite nice. Can I ask, this is sort of just a detail thing, but is everything digitized already, even if it's not in some kind of useful database or presented online? In other words, if you have a piece, is it safe to say that it's been digitally photographed already or no? If any museum tells you their whole collection is digitized, (laughs) they're lying. I wouldn't believe it. (laughs) We've been very lucky. We had a grant from IMLS, which is the Institute of Museum and Library Services to digitize our art collection. And so that has been ongoing since 2019 and we're getting pretty close. It took a little longer because it's really hard to photograph things when you can't be on site. Part of that was some training so that we have people here that are um, doing the works on paper. 
So we're getting close on that. Our archives collection will take a while um, because the volume of archives is just such that it takes a while to describe and to digitize. So it's an ongoing process. And then when you get to the historic homes, we have like a lot of discovery images. So essentially we call a discovery image when it's a snapshot that has a piece of paper that has the identification number on it, which Ellen, maybe you saw when you were deep diving into collections online, because we have published them because we think that something is better than nothing. So by the time we're done digitizing everything, there will probably be holographic cameras and we'll have to start over again. And that's something that's a format change is a thing. A lot of our collection at the time of the catalog resume, uh, the 1999 print one has transparencies and transparencies fade in color, they get scratches, they get dust. We are trying to do the process right now in a preservation standard that is up to federal guidelines. But in 20 years, we know that technology, so um, the work of a digital person is never done. <laughs> You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us about the work that you've been doing and the work that you're planning to do. We were talking about where you are on the spectrum, where you've been working hard on digitizing art and then adding those digital objects to your database and describing them. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you approach description, because I found the descriptions very robust and helpful and interesting. When I was looking at clothes, for example, there would be information about the maker. That's how I learned that George O'Keefe owned Balenciaga clothes. She had fine taste. Sometimes the country of origin, you know, I learned about her Italian shoes. And then a physical description. I mean, it was all adding much more context to every single item. Yeah, in our museum nerd world, that is called cataloging. That's actually a very important thing. When we're publishing something that we do not impose our small world museum language and thought processes around general audience, because how you describe something is what's more important than how we think of it. And I wanted to give a huge shout out for people who are catalogers here who describe the art, our collection managers, our registrars, Judy Smith, Cherry Sorensen, and um, on our archive side, we have Ashley Barnack. I hope I'm saying her last name correctly, head of research collections and services, Liz Ernst, and then our library research associate, Tori Dugan. And I want to give a shout out to all those people because their jobs have a heavy component around cataloging the works that come in. It's not only helping to preserve the artwork because we need to know where it is, what it is, and then the projects that we've been doing and that we do together to publish this is where we look at, are we describing things the same way? Are you calling a date the same way a date? Are you doing that? And so these teams have been cataloging things for years. And then when we looked at and worked together as a team, how do we publish this? How do we create connections? 
that's when we had to think about new workflows and how we do that and capture that in ways that communicate with one another. But it is a lot of work and especially the description, Sherry Sorensen is just a fantastic describer. And so when I need something, that's the little description text around what something is underneath that. When I need something described now, I'm, I go to Sherry and I say, help me. <laughs> <laughs> and just to further extend that is that one of the things that we're thinking about even more are visual descriptions. So we have another grant from the IMLS on DAI, so Diversity, Accessibility, Equity, and Inclusion. And we just had a team out here last week and did a workshop on how better to visually describe for those who have low or no vision. So that's an area that we're even thinking about how description can help make collections even more accessible. It's always been the work of a museum to make sure you know what you have and make sure you know where it is and what its condition is. And just like when shops went online, they had inventories. And then when you think about an inventory as being something in a store of how you're going to print that as an online store, you just have to think a little bit differently about it, but it really is the core of the work that they do. And we've really all thought together about how to best present that. And I think the projects that we have coming up then are also looking at well, what other information are you collecting and storing and does that need an audience need? So I often look at what they do as their work, such as keep track of exhibitions, keep track of what's in an exhibition, and they are already doing that. So it was one of the reasons why that's a need. We can present information that's not already out there that we have and connect it with archival collections. So it's always a back and forth. I just wanted to back up to something that you threw out, and I won't get the term right, so you'll have to help me here. You said something about digital access and equity. Yeah, there's an acronym around it that's often used, DEAI, or sometimes that's in different order. And so it's diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. That particular project, and in general, the idea is about how do we make our museums more inclusive, how do we think about the varying stories around the materials that we have? So that can be about content. That can be about how a visitor of any kind is treated when they come into the museum, the services that we offer for people of differing abilities, how we approach that with online collections. So in a digital environment, is it visually described? Is the website accessible? Is the museum accessible and things like that. So that's another project that is always something that we can always be better at, right, in any field. So we are looking at that here through this grant to see how we can be a more inclusive and welcoming museum on digital, in person, across the board. Does that work fit in with what you were talking about with the envisioning of the catalog resume where you can have multiple voices without impacting the authority of the catalog? Yeah, I think it fits into the vision in a few different ways. It fits into the vision of how we're sharing collections. I think that one thing is when you looked at collections online, we present a variety of options and there is that description, but there's not a whole lot of interpretation. And in terms of a content strategy, I kind of think that if you put one interpretation there, then you're actually kind of like leaning towards there's one way to talk about a thing. Now, description is one thing, but one of the projects that we're working on, and this is funded by the Toma Foundation, a digital change maker grant, is then adding a storytelling tool layer. And you've asked me before, Ellen, about how we decide what projects to pursue. And this kind of comes out of, well, how do we tell stories, but how do we not embed the story as this story is the ultimate truth about this work? And also in the galleries, we have the need to kind of tell more stories, especially if something is an archival object in a vitrine and you can't get close to it. Capturing all those stories, but also having those connected to the artwork, connected to the archive. But that means that various different stories can be connected by various different authors so that we're presenting a variety of voices around the objects. And then as we look down the road at the digital catalog resume, taking that into that, there's not one story to tell. There's not one person to tell that story how do we make sure that any story is authored so that you know where it's coming from, that it's not an institutional voice, 
that in a digital catalog resume, my dream is that you could have different attributed voices that are dated. So there's almost like a history embedded in it, in and of itself. I think it's just a way that we're trying to think about everything now in terms of getting away from the word authoritative in all cases, thinking about, well, how do we deliver reliability, but also complexity? That is part of diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. There's a lot of different ways that you can look at that. I think it's our responsibility that each of us as a professional thinks about how can everything I do become more inclusive in every way. If it's okay, I'd like to tease something out there just a little bit more. So when you say reliability in this context, that's really things that might be related to provenance or location. This painting was painted in 1939 and it was sold to such and such a person. But on the storytelling side, could you give maybe, for the sake of our listeners, a concrete example? When you say that there are stories to be told, what does that actually look like? Yeah, if you look at collections online and you can go down rabbit holes and you can kind of see how things are connected, but then some things aren't as obvious. So it can be pretty obvious if this thing is connected and it looks like a sketch of this. So... That's probably a sketch of that. But let's say that we wanted to, beyond just showing a list of artworks, tell that story of the painting of the Black Place. So I brought this up before that we have paintings of the certain landscape that Georgia O'Keeffe used to go and she would camp there and she loved camping there. It's a geological wonder, this place, like the different kinds of rocks and everything. So. You can tell a story about how she went camping there and what that meant and who was taking the pictures and what that means. What was that person's role in this? But you could also tell a story about the geology of the place. I guess what I'm getting at is that if you have one blurb or one kind of thing that's attached to that record, you can't tell the multiple stories. And where this gets to broader stories is that so the geology of the place could be a main topic of a story. Or you could talk about, well, who have been the custodians of this land for the last thousand, two thousand years? And what does that mean now? And there are other stories about this place. You know, if you drive past this area, you will see a lot of oil wells. And so what is the future of this place? So I think that I think that when you have authored stories that can have their own topics, they can be attached to that record and that theme but you can actually get a little more into a topic than perhaps if you're telling one institutional story. Because that story about where will it be in 10 years or what is the past of this or should someone be camping on there? You know, um, you can actually get to deeper topics and maybe more difficult topics to talk about if you have different kinds of things. And you can draw upon the collection resources. You can draw upon the photographs, the paintings, which might be more relevant to some of those stories than others, but the letters about it, the other documents about these spaces or things like that. So I think that's what we're talking about, is anchoring in collection objects, but being able to kind of look at them from a variety of viewpoints. And I know we might be getting a little far afield here. Are you bringing in other people to sort of add to that descriptive material in these storytelling ways? You're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten there yet, and I think that's a really good question. I'm building a framework for these things. I think the first kind of prototype story will be around historic exhibitions, since we're also building the exhibition archive through that same digital change banker grant from Toma. And I think that in the digital catalog resume research, that we actually are just exploring. So I think it will be an exploration of how would you bring in other voices what is the evaluation team of change and that kind of thing? Because some catalog resumes have secret evaluation teams because it is certifying work, which means that if you expose who people are, they could be influenced. If someone certifies a work to be a Monet, all of a sudden what you own is worth a lot more money than if it was by my cousin. So I think we're building the frameworks and talking about what those mechanisms, what I do know is that just from best practice principles, when we get there, everyone has to get paid for their work and the right amount of money. And there has to be a collaborative vision around 
how that is developed. Because if you go to someone and you're looking for a diverse perspective on something, you can't already know what that diverse perspective is. And I think this is where it's very interesting in terms of grants writing and grants evaluation. Many grants, if you don't know what you're going to write and you're not letting that up to the collaborative process, it is a knock against you in the grant. So I think this is something that I've had with a lot of grant makers and teams, we've kind of talked about like the conundrum of being more inclusive because many grants that we write, if you don't have exactly what you're gonna write and who's gonna write it, it's a weakened grant. And that's why the current works that I'm doing are everything's kind of set in stone, which I hope that as we can move forward in the future, we can have things that are broad ideas and then we can allow more room for a different voice to develop. I don't know if you all have experienced that in grants, if you think I'm on track. That's Ellen's world more yeah. than mine. <laughs> you know, I think it depends on the agency, right? The granting agency and what they're willing to tolerate. Yeah, but I think that that's something that in terms of moving in this new direction and letting go of some control... Or museums will have to find money in their budgets to do it and let go of control. And I think with good examples, it will help funding agencies see and would help also then explain, this is what we're going to do. We can't tell you exactly. So I've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go. But really just having intentional frameworks to move in that direction. Well, I love that you're pushing the envelope. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thanks for joining us today, Liz. I guess I wanted to start by asking if the Georgia O'Keeffe is the only museum doing this work, or are there other museums who are approaching the curation of digital experience in a similar way? Do you have colleagues in this adventure? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I think that in museums, we're all thinking about this in some ways, and archival collections and libraries are also thinking about digital collections and how to connect things up. We are part of a community that's called the Linked Art Community, and it is a series of people who are looking to approach museum collections in a particular way, using linked open data, using certain vocabularies that are standards in the museum field, whether they're from the Getty or from Library of Congress. And so there is a group and a framework that is kind of supporting this so that we're all going down the same direction, so we're not making things up as we go along. Because even when you have standards, there's so many standards to choose from, <laughs> and there's always decisions to be made within those standards. So this group helps to say, well, this is the one we're going to pick for this. This is the one we're going to pick for that. And we've tried to conform to that, and that makes us part of a loose community in that way. And as people are looking at that, there's been more activity around artworks themselves and less around connecting with archives Though there was a project called the American Art Collaborative, AAC, and they actually were precursors to us that were looking at connecting the American art from 13 different institutions across the country using linked data. And so they were the ones that kind of worked out some of the problems and the kinks so that we could start where we started. That's ultimately where this linked art group came out of because it was a realization when they started that everyone was looking at standards but interpreting them perhaps in slightly different ways. And there was an archival component of that as well in that the American art archives. 
So I think that there is a community. I think there's not been as many live, so there's been a lot more prototyping. So I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done because it's live and out there. And that's my way of doing things. It's like, get it out there, get it in the hands of the users because we learn so much. We learn by doing, we learn by seeing what the possibilities are, both as a staff and what works, what doesn't work. When we originally released it, we put a big beta sign on it. And I think as we move into our next projects, there are different people who have done bits and pieces. So for example, as we're looking to publish the archive of historic exhibitions, MoMA has done that. So I talked to the person who kind of led that effort and what did they learn in doing that? What would they have done differently? Just really talking to different professionals who have done different pieces of it. Digital publications, the Getty has a community of people around this product called Choir. It's open source, but not super open because they can keep the community, they know who's involved. They have a forum. And so when we do a digital publication that's connected, I can write to them and say, who's had this problem? So there are a lot of communities that I tap into for the various parts that we get to. And hopefully they tap into us so that we can say, how are we putting this together? Because I think one of the unique things that we're doing is really trying to keep it all part of one ecosystem does something that has this active and updated, can it be a catalog resume at all? So I think even now we're getting what are the key questions and through those different sets of research, the surveys, the one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, and then ultimately workshops, what really draws itself out of there of the challenges and opportunities. And then of course, in the end, what are the challenges and opportunities and how you can mitigate the challenges and how you can take advantage of the opportunities. And then of course, we at the O'Keefe Museum will have to decide how far do we take it? So that's the great part about a level one grant is it's the exploration phase. It's not the commitment phase. But there are additional levels of this digital humanities advancement grant. And so what would the next level be? It's the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant. It's a level one. I think they have two or three levels. I don't remember how many levels they have for this specific grant. The way I look at it is I think we'll want to, in the spirit of what I talked about, is I want to get information in the hands of people as quickly as possible. If I were to look into a crystal ball, I think we would have a long-term plan for what we want ultimately. But of course, all of the research that goes into updating a full catalog resume, it can be a five or 10 year project because you need to find all the works. Now we're doing an update. So maybe it's less of that because there is a catalog resume that we're working off of. What I think that we will do is look at, well, what are different ways that we can take aspects of this? So actually publishing historic collections, it's already approaching one aspect of the catalog resume because it's taking care of an exhibition history, but in a digital data-driven way. So I'm a little bit on the obsessed side. So every project I do is one step in that direction. So again, if I had to look at a crystal ball, what I would really like to see is start giving access to what are all of the artworks by O'Keeffe that we know of and we know where they are and have that findable. And that's a lot easier to do than say you have the scholarly apparatus done for each one of those. I think that developing APIs so that you can have relationships with most of the public collections and how does that scale if you have 138 of them? That would be an interesting project that I think would be a next step. And I think that would add to the field in general of like, okay, we know how to talk to APIs, but if you're a small museum and you want to talk to 138 museums, how do you scale that? And I think that's had some discussions I've had with other professionals. And then, you know, start to have a whole track for the research aspect of it, which is updating everything. But there's only one way to get to the end of the long road is to start traveling. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of um, different ways. You're kind of probably getting a sense of how my brain works. <laughs> it's kind of a network like linked open data, but I foresee that there are a lot of ways that every year we can provide more to our audiences while also taking that long view of providing new research and really updating this and providing a resource that is reliable, but also is a generative tool that incorporates a lot of different ideas. If we can work with other smart people to think about how do you scale with 138 APIs when you don't have a programmer in your place, also knowing that probably 60% of those museums are just getting their collections online now or even still thinking about that. 
So I think that these are really interesting issues and that if we do it right and we engage the right people, we can solve some problems that are beyond solving what we're trying to solve ourselves. And give that back to the community. Liz, I'm curious, your title is curator of digital experience at the O'Keeffe Museum, but you weren't born that, or at least most likely you weren't. So what's your background and how did you actually end up doing this kind of work? I think I've been extremely lucky is what I think. <laughs> so this will give away my age to a certain extent. <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> I was really lucky to kind of hit the job market, like get out of school or undergraduate, right when the first dot com, which maybe people don't even know what dot com boom is anymore, but such that all of the people that actually knew something about technology or like officially had schooling were getting high paying jobs. So basically, if you could show, I know how to do this, this is what I do at home, you know, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but if you showed promise in this area and were left to kind of do things. So I worked at the Northwestern University Libraries and they had so many needs back in those days. So they would assign someone from each department that showed interest in digital. So we all trained ourselves together in some form of, you know, back then we were coding HTML. And then we would help faculty make their own web pages and things like that. And based on that, I got a job at the Art Institute of Chicago managing servers because they're like, well, you know, seems like you could probably learn how to do it. And so that was before like digital was really a thing. You know, there would be a whole education department sharing one computer, or we still had what we called in those days local talk. And so that meant that there were um, phone wires that would just be tangled and daisy chained around a room. And, and mind you, I'm not that old. It's just that we were kind of behind. <laughs> So yeah, we picked up the rotary phone. And so as you can tell, I'm excitable and I'm excited and I'm curious. And so here I was at the Art Institute of Chicago and I saw all these possibilities. Uh, I started working there in 1997 and there were a lot of smart and excited people around me who wanted to advance the field, whether they were a curator or someone dealing with collections information or in education, a digital interactive or something like that. So whether it was scholarly interaction or education or collections information. And so I got to be at the center of all of those kinds of things for many years and help, of course, with all of the colleagues around me, help to design the field of digital experience with other digital technologists and with the power of the Art Institute, great team to learn from. So I feel extremely, extremely lucky. And I would point out that Liz is still making it up as she goes along. She's still expanding the boundaries and maybe creating a new kind of museum must have, right? Yeah, I think I was extremely lucky because I think it is a feature of going from an analog to a digital generation that I had. But if I have an opportunity to mentor people coming into the field now of just having that curiosity seeing where we can push boundaries. You know, even though these are set fields now, I think the opportunity that people have now is to also go between museum and private sector, just learning those best practices from both places. And so I think you're right that it's not the same now, but I think that any time that we talk to people going this field, it's just like saying that there are still these opportunities, there's still ways of looking at it and finding alliances. I think that's one thing I've learned is how do you find the people to work with? Because not everyone wants to be engaged in this kind of dialogue. And so I think who are the champions? How do you identify the perfect partners? And it's not always the department head, it's not always the VP. Who can you work with at the School of the Art Institute? Well, it's people who are uh, making their name. I think that what you get from time is who are the perfect partners. My last piece of advice for everything, never do a job you don't want to do. I mean, do things you don't want to do, but if you hate your job, find a new line of work because you got to have the passion and love, especially in the communities because there are downsides, usually around paycheck. <laughs> If you would like more information, you can visit the O'Keeffe Museum online at o'keeffemuseum.org. And of course, the museum itself is located in beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten. 